I think we're good. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar from Laser and Skin Surgery Center of New York. I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Elliot Weiss, and he is speaking on a very important topic that we have a lot of experience with at our practice, and that is permanent makeup removal. Dr. Elliot Weiss is actually our medical director from our Southampton location, which may not everyone realize that we have a great location in Southampton. It's actually a full-time office, so not just in the summertime, with four dermatologists and one PA. Just a little bit about Dr. Weiss before we get into this. Uh, he has an amazing pedigree. He went to Harvard for undergraduate. He went to John Hopkins for his fellowship. And he also did a Mohs surgery and cosmetic dermatology fellowship with Dr. Roy Geronimus before he started the practice in the Hamptons and opened it 12 years ago. Today, he runs the practice and he also speaks nationally at conferences. He publishes peer reviewed journal articles. He's even authored, authored textbook chapters. And um, the practice is um, blessed to have a full suite of lasers. So it's absolutely up to par with what we offer in, in Manhattan. We also offer, gen offer general dermatology, including pediatric with our associate, Dr. Abraham. We offer Mohs surgery, and of course, a full suite of cosmetic dermatology from injectables like Botox and fillers to lasers to body sculpting and everything in between. And I guess outside of work, Dr. Weiss had, um, if you didn't know, he was a former college tennis player and teaching pro, which is so cool. And now he spends time within the Hamptons with his wife and his two what do we call them? Our, your tween daughters. Mm -hmm. So um, without further ado, I am very excited for this topic. It's definitely something that the Laser Skin Surgery Center of New York has become very well known for. We have patients flying in from not only regionally, but around the country and even around the world, because some of the before and afters that you'll see today are not, they could not just be done by anyone and not just with any technology. They really require the right technology, the right skill and the right experience. So Dr. Weiss, take it away. All right, thank you, Risa. Um, yeah, hello everyone, um, welcome. I'm excited to talk to you uh, today, but I think it's a really important topic. It's become increasingly relevant <clears throat> really over the last decade, and even in the last few years, the, in, you know, the rise of permanent makeup, you know, that area has really exploded with new techniques, microblading, micro tattooing, um, a whole new slew of instruments that people can use for various types of semi and permanent makeup. And inevitably, as more and more people have this procedure done, there is a percentage of them that wish they didn't have it done or wish to modify it or remove it. And it turns out it's a highly, we can be highly successful in doing it, but it, it, it does require very specific um, equipment and knowledge and experience treating it. So I'm hoping uh, the talk today will just give you a nice background and really understand what permanent makeup is as well as understanding what the treatment entails. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get started. Um, just a little bit about our office. So as Risa mentioned, you know, I started the practice 12 years ago, but we've really grown to a full, um, really a full dermatology center offering a wide range of services. We're located right in Southampton Village, open um, year round. And we really have got a nice, um, assortment of the cutting edge uh, technologies, which some of which I'll be speaking about in this talk. <clears throat> so rather than jump right into the medical, I wanted to just spend a few minutes, try to put a little context to what we're talking about, sort of the, you know, briefly some of the origins of makeup, you know, how we've, you know, gone from, you know, the upper left, which would be sort of early use of ochre pigments, more Aboriginal tribes to in the middle here, we have, you know, modern day makeup, which is you know, metallic, neon, waterproof, smudge proof, um, you name it. And then now in the bottom right corner, we have all these things that are now permanent or semi-permanent versions of makeup. So, you know, for really hundreds of thousands of years, humans have used various natural pigments as adornment um, uh, on themselves or as animals, as parts of ritual or different customs. And there's a lot of data showing that this dates back, you know, way beyond 250,000 years in Africa. The ochre pigments are really clays that are colored by iron oxide. So they give these sort of earth tones, red, yellow, brown, purple. And, you know, they describe this uh, uses of the ochre 
on you know, painting animals or individuals. And you know, these usually conveyed messages that were relevant to the, to the societies or the cultures. And then you know, it turns out from a practical standpoint, they did provide some protection from the insects and, and sun exposure. And these are just some examples of you know, modern day okra dormant that's still seen in, you know, on the right, there's some Aboriginal tribes in Australia and then on the left from Africa. So it just shows that, that these were some of the earliest kind of forms of what, you know, we would maybe say the pre, you know, precursors of, you know, modern makeup. <clears throat> so then, you know, going back to the first dynasty in Egypt, there's uh, a lot of historical records showing that they did have a lot of what we would consider, you know, cosmetics. They utilize eyeliner, lipstick, makeup for the eyes, as well as different topical preparations to soften and hydrate the skin. And, you know, that's evident in uh, the various, you know, tombs, the busts of, of various individuals. You can see here clear eyeliner, eyebrow uh, markings, even, you know, areas of lipstick. So the thought was that that was sort of one of the first well-documented kind of early makeup uses. And then over the, the millennia, you know, almost every culture, you know, I'm naming not a, this is not an extensive list, but, you know, the Greeks, Romans, Persians, Chinese, Japanese, Korean and Indian cultures and other ones have really just expanded out with new substances, new techniques, uh, new trends. And then, you know, as a result, we've ended up in today's, you know, modern makeup world where we have, like I mentioned, we have every color under the rainbow and then some, there's glow in the dark, there's metallic finishes, matte finishes, shiny finishes, you know, you name it, as we all know, waterproof, smudge proof. So it seems like we've, we've kind of mastered that. So, you know, why permanent makeup? You know, my guess is just, we just kind of have this quest to always have something a little bit better, <clears throat> but you know, there, there clearly can be some advantages to, you know, why would somebody, you know, why do you want permanent or semi-permanent makeup? First of all, it's a time saver. If you spend time every day doing your eyebrows or eyeliner, then certainly if you can avoid that um, chore every morning, then you're saving a lot of time. And, you know, when done correctly, it has a very professional look. You're not requiring yourself to have that same ability to pencil in the perfect eyebrow. In theory, you have a professional looking eyebrow and it's there every single day. And if it looks great, if you think it looks great, it's gonna look great 24 seven and it's not gonna smudge or it's not gonna run. So this sounds perfect. Why would we not get this? Well, the issue is that if you don't like it, you can't wash it off and it doesn't, uh, you can't wipe it off. And unfortunately, if, it, if you think it looks bad to you, it will look bad 24 seven as well. And unfortunately, if trends change, the permanent makeup doesn't, although some of these will fade. Um, but, you know, it's important to remember that it's, it's, a, it's a more significant decision because there's, um, at a minimum, it takes usually years for this to fade. And I haven't seen it really fade completely to the point where someone's really happy. If they're really unhappy with it, most people don't wanna sit and wait um, you know, many months or years. So you know, as we get into this discussion, I think the most important thing, which Risa mentioned is, you know, people think of you know, permanent or semi-permanent makeup. You know, what we're really talking about, we're talking about a tattoo. So I think that's an important thing to just realize. Um, it's not meant to scare somebody, but I think it's more to understand that it, it is a, it is a you know minorly invasive procedure, and it has implications because it's gonna it's gonna stay for a very long time. And just like normal tattoos, they're handmade, so it's gonna depend on the artist's skills, the materials they have, and the tools they have. So it's simply a form of facial tattooing, and like I mentioned, especially you know, in the past five to 10 years, the, you know, the inks and the techniques have really evolved and they've been modified specifically for the purpose of semi-permanent and permanent makeup. Initially, which I'll discuss, they were the you know, permanent makeup was essentially a tattoo just placed on the face. Now with the really explosion of microblading and, and variations of that uh, micro shading, microblading, they've developed a whole new set of inks that are very specific to that procedure, um, as well as a lot of new techniques and instruments that have really allowed them to refine it. In many instances, you know, do pretty amazing um, artistic work uh, for these eyebrows and, and, and uh, eyeliner um, semi-permanent tattoos. So what could possibly go wrong? A lot of things. Um, as you can see, there can be overcorrection and the wrong color. That's 
to me, probably the most common thing people complain about. You know, if they ask for something and it's just overfilled an area that really the person never had an eyebrow there, they wanted just a little thickening of the brow, not a new uh, upper border. So I think, you know, overcorrection is, is clearly a very common problem. Uh, pigment migration, which you can see sort of in the middle, uh, not going to really happen with microblading, but you can see that with more traditional, you know, tattooed permanent makeup where you just have the ink does not stay in place and it migrates out. Um, and that can be something that's really cause of concern for a patient clearly. And then you need to have the wrong shape. Um, and so you can imagine just like any regular tattoo can go wrong in various different ways. Same thing with permanent makeup. So that's a distinct possibility. So what are, what are the new modern methods? So microblading, as I'm sure most of us have heard about, has really taken off and the, the field has really matured quite a bit. So it is quite amazing what can be done um, in terms of realistic looking eyebrows in, in particular versus some of the, you know, the very uh, early tattoos were essentially blocked in shapes of, of an eyebrow like you'd be sketching with a marker. Um, so with microblading now they have, which you can see on the far, let me see my cursor, you know, on the, on the far left, they have these little hand, handheld tools that have very, thin blades, and those are pulled across the skin in little, you know, arc motions to try to recreate the shape of little hairs, and then the ink is placed into those little grooves, and so it ends up placing it much higher in the skin, you know, very upper dermis, just under the epidermis, so it is more superficial, and as a result, they will tend to fade more, and in theory, most people say these will fade over time. Um, it's usually, you know, many months to years. Um, and then in addition to the microblading tools and the inks, there are also, have, they've developed a wide range of new handheld, what's called uh, nano gun, uh, basically tattoo guns, but they're very small. They're designed for more delicate areas of the face, um, eyelid, eyebrow, and basically the safety features that have been included are some little guards to prevent an overaggressive placement of ink, and as well as different inks to be used. So all of these have really been designed uh, specifically for this use uh, to try to create a more realistic, natural looking um, eyebrow or eyeliner. So again, this is just another visual, just, you know, kind of diagram. And you can see with the microblading, the, the injuries are just, you know, just in the upper, upper dermis, below the epidermis. So it is a more superficial pigment and there's less of it. Um, with the micro nano guns, it's more of a small traditional tattoo gun and that places ink much deeper into the dermis, but also it results in what you can see on the right, a, a less natural appearance. You can see on the, on the far right, the three photos on the, the upper and the lower are clearly microblade, microblade eyebrows. And you can see, you know, it, it appears that there's very specific individual, much closer to individual lashes, whereas in the, the, the middle picture, it almost looks like a herringbone pattern. And that's just because there's limits to the, to the size of the line that can be drawn with these nano guns versus the micro blade, you can have a very, very thin, almost a wisp of, of pigment, which translates into a more realistic looking uh, eyebrow. So this just again, uh, I'm going to show a couple images from something called optical coherent tomography. Basically, it's just an imaging tool that allows us to look subsurface so we can look at what's found below the surface of the skin. It's a non-invasive diagnostic uh, tool. And what I just wanted to show, you know, in the, in the upper picture, you can see within the red box is just an, a top-down view, a digital photo of a, of a portion of a tattoo. This is not on the face, but just, and then the middle picture, you can see that's the same portion of the tattoo. And then the third picture basically is just showing where the ink is placed. And if you look at that bottom photo, the little, the bright white line at the top, that's the top of the epidermis. And, and then if you kind of, if you squint your eyes and look at them, you should notice kind of right next to the yellow numbers, two kind of dark areas that are pushing up against the the, der the epidermis, and that's that's where the ink's placed. And it just shows that sort of mid mid dermis. Uh, same thing here is just another example of demonstrating the depth. So on on the left, that's the control, and you can see just normal looking skin. And then on the right, the tattoo again, right where that 
there's a little arrow with the 190 where that little dark opaque um, coloration is that's the ink placement and you can see that you know looking at that distance and that in that individual skin it's in that mid upper dermis um, which is consistent with what we we're just describing with a traditional tattoo <clears throat> so here's a, an important takeaway so successful laser removal of, of permanent or semi-permanent makeup really comes down to these two key factors most importantly you have to have the correct technology and that's in order to make it effective and safe and so the two technologies that we use are the Q-switch laser and now um, the picosecond pulse laser. And the picosecond, obviously a new cutting edge uh, device. We have the Pico Plus here in uh, Southampton as well in New York City. And it's really, I think, one of the most cutting edge devices for uh, particularly this application. And the other flip side of the coin, you need an experienced physician operating that piece of technology. And the key is the physician really needs to understand what the appropriate wavelength needs to be for that individual, understand the energy and the settings and the appropriate um, you know, recovery and expectations uh, for the patient. And really, that's really a key, the right technology, the right individual using that technology. And we usually, uh, it's usually a very successful procedure. So without getting into too much physics, um, this just essentially describes how these lasers work. And the idea is that you match a wavelength of light that is preferentially absorbed by the target chromophore, which in this instance is the tattoo ink. And by pulsing the energy very quickly, it's absorbed by the tattoo ink and either fragments it or causes almost a little acoustic uh, you know, explosion of the ink and it sort of fragments it. And then the body naturally clears out uh, the sort of the damaged ink, and over time, the ink uh, in the skin fades, the tattoo fades. And we know for different colors, there are specific wavelengths that are more effective. And so I've just listed a few for the blue black, the Ruby laser 694, the Alexandrite, uh, the ND YAG, which um, is effective on a lot of colors. And also that we have that in both the Q switched as well as the Pico second, as well as the Ruby laser we have as a Q switched. Um, and then there's a 532, which is used for red and orange. And, you know, those are really important details to know. Um, most of the microblading uh, and cosmetic um, semi-permanent makeup tends to be in the black, flesh-colored, brown. Um, but you see sometimes some reds, so you, you have to be aware of which wavelength to use. And on, I'll show you in a, in a few slides later, as you go on, there can be color changes and it's really important to, to be very comfortable in understanding what needs to be done to correct any color change that occurs during treatment. So briefly, what's the difference between a Q-switch and a picosecond laser? A lot of it's just the timing of the pulse. Um, with a Q-switched uh, laser, that the energy that we're using is being pulsed in, it's measured in billions of seconds. Whereas with a picosecond laser, you know that's been cut down to trillions of seconds. And the idea is that the shorter the pulse, you know, you're able to more effectively uh, break up the tattoo ink, which results in, you know, the end result being more effective treatment, fewer treatments. And basically this ultra short pulse really confines that energy from the, the laser to the tattoo ink and not allowing it to diffuse and disperse and injure the, the normal healthy skin surrounding the, the tattoo. So again, very basic diagram, you know, the idea is just trying to show is, you know, ink is placed in the skin. With each treatment, the laser's pulsed, you get a certain fragmentation of a percentage of the ink particles. The body's not, the immune system clears out that sort of fragmented ink that translates into a slight lightening of the tattoo. Subsequent treatments occur, and you just see continuous lightning and lightning. But a lot of this depends, the speed in which this occurs, again, is very specific to the tattoo at hand. Um, it varies based on the amount of ink, the color, um, if it's been redone, if it's been retouched, the location on the body. So there are a lot of factors that come into play um, when trying to predict, you know, how many treatments is this going to require? Because that's a frequent question, which I'll address a little later on. Fortunately for a lot of the, certainly with the microblading, there's less ink. It's much quicker usually than a typical traditional tattoo. But nonetheless, um, at this point for removal uh, almost always requires multiple sessions. So what do you expect on the day of treatment? 
Well, the area for like the eyebrows, typically I'll put some numbing cream on and then you know, sometimes I'll put a little injection of a little lidocaine so it, it, the pain is not an issue. Uh, the treatment really only takes minutes and typically, particularly with the picosecond laser, there's usually minimal to no crusting. You have some redness to the area and sometimes it can be fairly red for either two, three days, uh, but it resolves. There's probably minimal wound care and you can do treatments once a month. You can also delay them longer, but usually you want to give it at least a month to see where how much of the tattoo has faded over that time. And then basically, like I mentioned, multiple treatments are almost always required, but it's really uh, based on the quantity of ink, the depth of the ink, the type of tattooing, um, and the age of the tattoo. If it's faded, there's less ink, it's gonna presumably come out quicker than something that's you know, much newer, richer, darker ink. So how do we keep the eye safety? How do we keep the eyes safe? Um, patients wear goggles um, if we're treating anything outside the orbit. If we're treating eye, um, eyeliner tattoo, that's clearly inside the orbit, in which that case we can safely treat that with you know, no risk, but we do have to use what's called an ocular shield. And it's basically a metal polished uh, cover that slips under the eyelid. We put a numbing drop in. It takes us seconds to place. It's not painful. It's just an odd sensation. And then we take it out immediately after the treatment. You can see this is it being placed. While it looks uncomfortable, it's, it takes a few seconds and it is, it's not painful. It's numb and allows us to very safely treat right uh, in the orbit. So here's just, we'll get into some, you know, before and afters. And this is clearly an eyeliner tattoo. And the middle picture you can see that's immediately post-treatment. There's an eye shield in to keep it safe. If you notice some of that redness, what you'll sometimes see on such fragile skin like the eyelid, the quick pulses of the laser cause almost, it's not a bruise, it's almost, it's like petechiae. It's, like it's almost like a bruise. So you get this bright red, it's just the little capillaries have been kind of ruptured in that surface. So it's nothing harmful. It just, it fades in a few days, but occasionally we'll see that with these very short pulses on sensitive skin and you get a, it's a very bright red color, um, but it's really just, it's sort of like a bruise, but it's just bright red at the surface and that goes away. But you can see from this before and after, you know, she was just looking to have something toned down and I mean, you know, clearly that was uh, pretty effectively accomplished. And that was with a Q-switch laser. And then here again, you can see this is uh, a different, this is with a picosecond laser. Um, again, uh, very nice removal. There's some very trace amounts. Um, and again, many times patients, uh, like in this example, they're happy with 95% clearance. If, you know, certainly if she wanted, you know, 100%, it probably would need a subsequent treatment. But you can see here is a really nice uh, improvement in that uh, removal of the tattoo, uh, normal skin texture, so I think that would be a, a nice successful treatment. And here's somebody who had, and this is what we'll see a lot of commonly. So this one was eyeliner and eyebrow. And it looks like, you know, this was more of a traditional tattooing. If you look at the eyebrow, which I'm seeing a bit of, I see some that are like, there's a light shading of almost a traditional type of tattoo placed in a more of a geometrical shape. And then sometimes almost looks like attempts to microblade within it. Um, clearly that's a little more ink, but, you know, after subsequent treatments, you know, this was clearly partially removed and sometimes people simply want it to be lighter. Um, you know, the black might've been a little too bold. Um, so in this instance, the patient was very happy because it, you know, clearly thinned out the eyeliner. The eyebrow is not colorless, but it is much, it's faded and they can choose to either have a different method of uh, permanent makeup placed on it, or if they really wanted to have it further removed, but most people still want to have some uh, version of, of an eyebrow if, if they needed that in the first place. Here's just another close up showing that we can treat very safely right up to the eyelid margin. Again, there's some little residual brown pigmentation. Uh, if that was an issue, another treatment would, would, would clear that up. Um, but it was such a dramatic difference that it, um, at this point, this was a happy patient. It was just another, this, this is a traditional tattoo eyebrow that's not microblade. You can see it's very geometrical shaped. And this just requires uh, typically more treatments than an equivalent uh, eyebrow that was microbladed because the, the placement of the ink is deeper. It's a different technique, usually more ink. So typically these require more treatments, but can easily be um, removed with, with multiple treatments typically. 
Again, here, it's just another example. There was a little overcorrection. Um, if you can see my cursor, but uh, basically, you know, she the the tattooing went up and beyond the natural border of her eyebrow, and it was just too dense. So, wanted just a lightening, not a total removal of the permanent makeup, and that basically was accomplished um, very effectively. And this was a picosecond laser, you know, a ten sixty four, um, and you can see here that again on the right, very much more natural looking, um, the ink that has gone above the superior eyebrow margin on the on her on her left eye um, that's that's gone and you can see you know some a little more normal appearing skin within the eyebrow men can have these too so men women doesn't matter they all respond the same this is a more traditional tattoo um, so again usually will take a little more a few more treatments just because there's more ink and it's been placed more deeply in the skin Again, I think this is a close up of an earlier photo, again, showing just a, a lightening up of the tattoo. There's still some residual amount of it, but a lot of times people don't mind if there's you know, a little bit left over because it does add a little more fullness or thickness to the, the eyebrow, but usually it's the fact that it goes up and beyond the natural borders that becomes you know, more noticeable. And that's usually a concern for the patient, a reason for them to come in. So lip liner, seen much less of that now, but occasion we do see that and sure enough it will respond uh, like other areas and again it really will depend on the colors used uh, occasionally which I'll get into they, they, they use colors that might undergo some changes during treatment and as long as the physician's aware and able to handle that and they warn the patient we work through it it's not a problem it's when someone's not prepared either the physician or the, or the patient that it can be problematic but it's usually fairly predictable when this is gonna happen. <clears throat> so speaking of that, so what are the complicating factors? When is this not just totally easy? Uh, well, there can be some, what's called paradoxical, it used to be just darkening, now it's a paradoxical color change because we, we've always known that in, in the more traditional tattoos, things that use you know iron or, or titanium, the whites, the reds, or the blends, those usually, when you treat them with a Q-switched or picosecond laser, you actually get a little oxidation and they darken. So if you treat a, a white tattoo, it usually turns gray-black, but then you can then treat through it, treat it as a black tattoo, and it will subsequently uh, usually lighten. Um, but again, all inks are not created equal, so that is true for many of these, but there are, there are exceptions to all the rules now because there's so many different inks, and unfortunately they're not, um, they're not regulated, so you don't really necessarily know which ink you're, you're using usually, or what, which ink you're receiving. Um, but you'll see also now, specifically, I think, to the microblading, um, color changes that I have not seen in more traditional tattoos. And when you try to really research what are the different inks they're being used, because there, there's a subset of different inks that people are using for microblading that they're not using for just tattooing. So they have a whole new set of inks what little bit I could find, it definitely a lot of these inks that appear to be one color are in fact blends of multiple pigments put together as a, as a blend. So the end result is what you'll see is some of these undergo some really interesting color changes that you really have to be aware of because I'm seeing it more and more commonly. But fortunately, if you know how to handle it, they also respond very predictably in, in, a, in a positive manner. So <clears throat> keep that in mind. Um, that is an important detail and that's why the experience of the physician and the right technology is really important. So other things that can complicate thing, if, a tat, if the makeup has been touched up, it's been corrected, you know, modified, all this leads to an increased ink load in the skin or if multiple colors have been added in, all of these most likely will increase the number of treatments required. And that holds true for traditional tattoos as well, not just permanent, semi-permanent makeup. So this is a great example um, of this paradoxical darkening. So the very top photograph, you know, January 10th, 2018. So a, a patient came in to me and this was the color of her eyebrows after she had them tattooed. And they were a, a red, a version of kind of reddish pink. She was very upset about that. And she was very adamant on wanting having them removed because she thought that that color just was not a natural color for her. The moment I saw them, I explained to her that while they can be removed, 
most certainly immediately after her first treatment, her eyebrows will switch color. She was fine with that. And sure enough, as you can see in the second photo, that was the color of her eyebrows. And that actually occurred you know, within seconds of the treatment. Funny thing is she was actually much happier. She said if she had to stay with the black eyebrows versus the red, she was much happier, which I agreed on her, matched her hair, was much more natural. Nonetheless, she did want to have it removed. Uh, so here I just included a few of the subsequent uh, treatments. And you can see we got to a point where it was um, fairly faded, not completely. You can see the left, uh, the tail of her left eyebrow was still a little darker, but she, she wanted to pencil it in. So to, to her, she didn't need 100% uh, removal. She just needed to be light enough that she could put a little pencil and you wouldn't notice. Um, but this was, you know, sort of your classic paradoxical darkening. Um, but if you don't warn a patient about that, that can be really concerning um, because it is, is a complete color change of the tattoo. But it is treatable, as you can see, you just have to use the right equipment. So this is the more common thing that I'm seeing now with microblading. And the top two pictures are, so the, the patient came to me and you know, she was unhappy with the, the eyebrow on her, her left eyebrow, you can see it was, it's much thinner. It's, it, it, they didn't apply as much ink, so it was almost a little gap uh, in that left eye, lower, the lower part of her left eyebrow versus the right, had, it was much darker, but it's hard to tell here, but that really extended beyond the, the border of her eyebrows. So she was unhappy. She said, I don't wanna have the microblading tattoo, sorry, the microblading makeup outside of where my normal hair grows. So. To me, you know, looking at this, it was a black gray ink. The moment we treated it, it turned, I would call it like a peach red uh, immediately. And, you know, I discussed this with her and said, well, we see these, this is one of these paradoxical color shifts that is, I would say, in my experience, unique to, to this type of ink. I haven't seen a black to peach uh, color uh, change ever happen in a normal tattoo. So initially she was quite, you know, surprised, a little upset, but we had discussed this, so it was not this possibility, so it wasn't really a surprise, and I reassured her that it can be treated. So you can see pre-treatment is on the top, middle one is after her second treatment, and so what I used was the, the, the Picosecond 532, which we typically use for red-yellow tattoos, and you can see on the bottom row, that is the result of treating that red area. And now you can see, if you look sort of compare the top to the bottom, you can see a nice fading in that area for two treatments. She was very happy. Clearly, um, the photograph on, on, on my right, her left eye, it, there's much less of eyebrow tattoo or eyebrow, you know, the microblading on the under surface, but that was true from the very beginning. So she actually wanted to have a, a, an additional treatment to her right eyebrow just to have it even up to her left. But I mean, she was very happy. It was a significant reduction, you know, two to three treatments and she was thrilled. Um, but again, this color change is important to be aware of because if, if you're not expecting or you don't know what to do, you suddenly have a very noticeable bright pink peach colored eyebrow, which if you, can, if you don't reassure and have confidence you can handle this, um, that can be a major problem for a patient clearly. So this is just a little animation to show the difference with two treatments before, after, I'm just trying to show you. So you can see, you know, I think a nice, a nice degree of fading with, with a single session. You know, the hair is still there. She didn't lose any eyebrow hair, but so that's two, two treatments. So what are the, what are the real takeaways? So the laser treatment of permanent makeup, semi-permanent makeup is very safe and highly effective when performed by an experienced uh, professional. Do your research. As we talked about, don't rush it. Look for examples of the artist's work, look for referrals. Um, it does have implications. Like I mentioned, it is a form of a tattoo. So remember that it's not just makeup, it's a, it's a tattoo on your face. So it's not gonna just go away very easily. It can be removed, but it's not a simple process in the, in the sense of, you know, with makeup, you use a makeup remover, it's gone. Um, so really do your research look at examples, um, ideally have a referral. Uh, and just remember, it's easier to get them than to remove a tattoo. So keep that in mind always. And you know, if there's a problem, I think this is a really important thing. If there's a problem, just think twice before simply adding more ink to the problem because you either you potentially could compound the problem. And I have seen that. I've had a number of patients that 
know, they didn't like the initial color. They let the, the artist do something else. And, and at least for the ones that show up in my office, that something else involved simply adding another color that did not help it, but only complicated the removal process. Because as I mentioned, the more inks, the more colors you're adding in, the more potential complications in terms of slowing down the treatment, requiring more treatments, et cetera. So definitely think twice if there's a problem. And, and most of all, make sure you see a knowledgeable laser surgeon for the best outcome. Because unlike, I think even for, for tattoos, that holds true. But you know, specifically, these are very um, specific types of tattoos. The equipment is very particular. The settings are unique for, for the body location. So it really is a more advanced procedure. But in the right hands, it's um, I think it's a very predictably successful procedure. And patients are usually uh, very happy because most of the time we can get pretty quick results uh, with, with minimal downtime. So that's it, thank you. Um, I guess we'll see if there's any questions. I was on mute. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. That was great. And yes, we have lots of questions. So everyone that submitted a question, stay tuned. We're getting to all of them now. Um, real fast. Um, if anyone would like, this is a good time to take a screenshot of what you see on the screen, and then I'll take it down so you can see Dr. Weiss a little bit bigger for him to answer all of your questions. So last chance for you to take this uh, screenshot. All right. You can also, you guys all know how to find this, I hope. So otherwise, thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. That was great. It was really it was impressive to see some of those before and afters, but it was also great to see some of the progress because a lot of times I'm sure the people watching, we only see the after, but it was nice for you to actually really show us what to expect in between. I, I really enjoyed that. All right. As I said, lots of questions, um, but this is a easy one to answer. So let's start here. Does Dr. Weiss only operate out of Long Island or are you in New York City too? Uh, at the moment, I'm only practicing in our Southampton office. Um, I, I am in at Cornell Med. I teach resident clinic one day a month, but it's really not my patients. I'm, I'm treating, I'm, I'm assisting the residents. So yeah, I'm at the moment, I'm full-time Southampton, but um, I do have weekend hours. So if anybody's out on a weekend, I do have Saturday hours throughout the year, except for the summer. Um, and otherwise here, you know, Tuesday through Friday, Saturdays. But at the, at the moment, I'm currently not operating out of our uh, Midtown office. Great. Yeah, usually you hear the opposite of people wanting the Manhattan doctors to come to Long Island. So yeah, Dr. Mm -hmm. Weiss is dedicated to the to the Hamptons here, um, to Long Island. But we uh, we do have, you know, 17 board certified experts at our Manhattan oh, office. So absolutely. I do assure you they can take care of you there as well. Um, all right. So is this treatment painful? Good question. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, if we did nothing in terms of no anesthesia, it, it is uncomfortable. It's very quick, but um, at least in my office, I'm always providing some form of anesthesia. Um, most commonly, I mean, let's talk about the eyebrows. Uh, some patients, we simply put a numbing cream if they are fine to sit for 30, 40 minutes. And it, you know, the treatment's really, you know, a couple minutes. So it's very quick and they usually tolerate that perfectly well. Um, if need be, I can do that very thing, put some topical numbing, and then I can inject a little lidocaine, in which case then the area is completely numb. We could operate on it. Um, and so they feel nothing. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be. I think sometimes when you look at online, I'm just thinking, because I've, I've heard this from patients, you know, you might see examples of tattoos being treated, you know, either on the body or, or on the face where they're using ice, the person's screaming, Usually that means that the operators of the device aren't qualified to inject the skin or apply an anesthetic. To me, that signifies a person who's probably not qualified to be using the device in my opinion. But yeah, so it doesn't have to be, you know, it shouldn't be a painful procedure. I mean, you might feel a pinch from the injection if we go that route, but pain is certainly not a reason to not, pain is certainly not the reason to not have that done. Absolutely. All right. Um, what is, is there an average number of treatments needed to remove microblading? And is it different than the average number needed to remove permanent eyeliner? Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, definitely microblade, you know, true microblading is a more superficial placement of ink. And I would say compared to any type of more traditional tattooing, it will be quicker. Um, a lot of it still 
depends on a lot of things, the color, the density of the ink, how old the, the microblading is, but generally speaking, I would say with a few exceptions, the microblading will, because of its superficial placement and less ink density, will respond much quicker than a you know, traditional, you know, tattooed permanent makeup or eyeliner. Um, in that example I showed you with the microblading that changed colors, I mean, that was after two treatments. I think she underwent a third one. Um, so it's definitely, and also it's going to depend if someone, most people aren't looking to necessarily remove 100% of the microblading. A lot of times it's simply, you know, the inner aspect of it, they over they overshot on the inside or they, they made the tail of the eyebrow too long or it's too high up here. So usually we're treating portions of the of the brow and just either lightening them or, or removing just portions. So, you know, it's I would hate to give you an exact number because it's, it's going to vary, but like I said, I have a lot of examples like the one I showed you with three, you know, two treatments. She was actually three treatments. Um, she was very happy, but even in two, it was a significant improvement. Um, had the tattoos not been asymmetrical when they were placed, she probably would have been happy with two. But um, again, it does vary. So I, I, I would always I hate to over over promise. I'd rather kind of under promise and over perform. But typically the microblading is much quicker. And I've had some that had you know, they just had a little bit in one area that was too, you know, too dark on the, on the tail of the eyebrow. And we did one or two treatments and they were perfectly happy. So it kind of depends also what you're, you're coming in looking to do, if it's removing the whole thing or a part of it. But generally, I said a few treatments, um, particularly with the Pico second laser, the Pico plus, um, finding you get qu quite a bit done with each treatment. Got it. Okay, well, then that is a great segue into this next question. I would like permanent eyeliner faded, not 100% removed. The cosmetic tattooist mixed blue with brown ink. Is it possible to remove the blue look or fade that, but leave the brown behind, basically to select for color when removing a tattoo? Uh, usually, I mean, not in those colors. There's going to be sort of a cross reaction. Typically, um, it's sort of thinking that it's like a, a blend because, unfortunately, the same. There, there, we don't really have a wavelength that's going to be just to get black, but not the brown at all. So usually you're going to get a overall lightening of both colors. Um, but it, again, it, it really depends on the exact color combination you're talking about. Um, but usually any kind of brown flesh colored is not a single color. It's going to be a blend of multiple colors. So kind of any anytime you are treating those, it's really hard to be selective because in fact, you're, you're treating a a kind of an unknown combination of, of pigments that gives the overall result of looking brown, but clearly like in that flesh, in the, in the eyebrow that I showed you, it, there was a, some sort of pink orange pigmentation or ink uh, mixed in with that for some reason. Um, so I think the answer to your question would probably be not really, but it, it kind of depends on you know, the specifics of the tattoo. But I would say if they've both been blended over the same ink is located in the same area of skin, um, most likely you're, you're not, you can't just selectively remove just the blue. Okay. Understood. And I guess that's, um, this, this next question, uh, what about a tattoo with multiple colors and is there a tattoo that's color that's easier to remove? Um, I guess I'm not sure if we're talking about like permanent makeup versus a regular tattoo. Um, are we, are we talking about just still they didn't clarify so maybe okay. maybe tattoos I yeah don't i mean or, tattoos or permanent in makeup. General, certainly i mean the the number of colors is growing exponentially so i think um certainly black ink is probably traditionally always the easiest to remove it, you know it has the the broadest absorption of all the wavelengths of of, of laser so it's very easy to, to have a wavelength absorbed by the ink so typically you know the, the common teaching is black is probably the easiest one to remove. Um, multicolored can be removed. We frequently do remove many colors, you know, reds, browns, green, blue, black, yellow, orange, um, combinations of that. So, I mean, most colors can be effectively removed. Um, certainly the combinations of colors can make it a little more a little trickier and because it's also not always abundantly clear what colors have been mixed if it's mixed in the same area 
But if you have distinct areas of color, yeah, we treat, you know, the red area, we'll treat with a 532 nanometer laser that's next to a black area. We treat that with the, either the 1064 uh, Pico Plus. So um, okay. certainly can treat different colors. Black is usually the easiest, but an important thing for, for even a regular tattoo, the difference between a, a, a tattoo that's black that they used a shading needle versus the needle they use for more kind of block print, that's a huge difference in the number of treatments. The shading needle is a more superficial placement, less dense ink, and that can be removed much quicker. So it, it's not just the color, it's also the, you know, the, the way the tattoo is placed. So that would be saying, you know, a black eyebrow is, can be removed, but a black eyebrow that's microbladed is almost certainly going to be removed much quicker than, uh, you know, a black eyebrow that was used with one of these nano pens, which is closer to more traditional tattooing. Um, so there's, there are a lot of variables, black, probably, you know, long winded answer, black's probably the easiest, you know, universally. Okay. But that is really interesting. And I know we touched on a little bit of tattoo um, removal, which was not exactly our topic today, but it's very related. Um, and if anyone has more questions about that, we, there's definitely a lot of content on our website. We do a lot of laser tattoo removal as well. But you even saw how Dr. Weiss said, oh, for the red color, we'll use this laser. And for the black color, we'll use this laser. And that's the same with permanent makeup. And that's why people are flying in from out of town because we have all of the lasers to be able to treat whatever the color is. And how interesting that I didn't even realize that it wasn't just black anymore. It's all these shades. The world of permanent yeah. makeup really has evolved. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's double-edged sword. Yeah. It is. Okay, um, one more question and then everyone wants to know the cost. I know guys, I'm not avoiding that question. We'll get to it. Okay, so um, can permanent, or, or two more questions real fast before we get to that. Can permanent makeup removal be combined with other treatments? Um, sure, I mean, I guess probably not on that, treatment area, but yeah, not uncommonly, someone could come in and have Botox and have their eyebrow, um, you know, I, you know, microblade eyebrows treated. Um, okay. You could have, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, yeah, absolutely. So you could, that could be combined with filler, Botox, other laser treatments. Um, I just, you know, as long as we're not talking about usually a procedure performed the exact spot of the eyebrow, I probably wouldn't but I'm not sure many things would be done on the same area of an eyebrow that's being treated. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And that's you know, okay. a lot of patients will come in and, you know, they'll take the opportunity to, you know, have their Botox done while they're having the microblading treated. But so absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you do your, make your way in to see Dr. Weiss, yes, Botox, fillers, lasers, all the good stuff at the same time. <laughs> um, okay. Do the lasers leave any scars or do they burn the hair? Uh, so it, they, should, you know, they should not leave any kind of scar. Um, and that's typically avoidable, um, almost always. Uh, there, are, As with anything, there can be incredibly rare circumstances, but uh, almost always with the appropriate settings, the appropriate wavelengths, the appropriate safety me measures, uh, scarring is not something that we would expect to see, um, particularly, and that's where it's really key to use the appropriate lasers. Um, we, there's plenty of reports somebody using a laser that's not meant to be for tattoo removal and you don't have that quick ultra short pulse and you absolutely can burn and illustrate the skin and it can be a, a real mess. But um, with the appropriate settings, these devices are really safe. So I really have really no expectation of leaving a scar. I really like, you know, the skin usually it turns out to be, you know, you can see from these photos, no visible scarring. Um, the hair, Usually what we'll apply is a like surgery, a little gel that helps minimize absorption, but you can sometimes get some of the hairs can get a little singed, the eyebrow hair. The, the good news is the picosecond lasers are not the same pulse duration as a hair removal. So they're not effective hair removal lasers. And uh, particularly for, I've found with, you know, microblading, we're talking typically a, a few treatments. So uh, that has not uh, turned out to be a, a you know hair loss it's not turned out to be a significant uh, issue at all in the patients um we're seeing more and more as you can imagine that the demand for that particular service has really taken off i think even more so in the last five years but as you can see just walking around in the hamptons or in the city or wherever you are more and more people have, are having this done so i think clearly as more and more people have this more and more people want to have it removed um, the good thing is we're getting more and more experience we're getting better and better at it and um, but I think at this point we can usually long-winded, but yes, can do it very safely. 
Uh, you should not lose all your eyebrow hair and you should not leave you with some uh, scar. So it usually can be done very effectively right. and safely. That's reassuring. Okay, last question before price. Um, if I don't like it, if I get microblading and don't like it, can I immediately come into you and have it removed? Good question. We hear that a lot, even more so about tattoos. Um, you know, the idea is with, with these tattoos, you know, well, first of all, when it's, when it's placed, there's a period of time where there's flaking and, and most people, if they've had this done, they'll understand that it can start off really dark and you get some almost peeling, like the scabs come off. So you, you definitely need to let the skin heal. Um, I would say at least a, a couple months, two months, probably the earliest. Um, and that, that holds true as well for, for traditional tattoos. We have patients that are called literally coming out of the tattoo parlor um, saying, I, this is not what I wanted. And we explain to them, you know, usually waiting minimum six, eight weeks. Um, the idea is that the body packages that ink, once it's placed in the skin, there are a few things that occur that the skin sort of packages the ink in certain, in a certain way. And it ends up, if you give it a little time, the removal process is usually a little more effective. So we'll say treating a brand new tattoo uh, generally the, the benefit you get from each treatment is going to be lower than treating something that's say a year old or four months. But that said, you know, for something like microblading, I, you know, you want to give it a few weeks to even heal to begin with. And you probably don't even know what it's ultimately going to look like for uh, at least weeks. So probably uh, you know, the earliest I would probably recommend would be, you know, six to eight weeks. Um, okay. Treatment. Okay, and now the big burning question, um, and then there's a couple more we'll get to afterwards. Is you know how much does this cost? What's the great what's question? It? I mean, that's a normal question. Everybody wants to know. Uh, again, part is going to depend on what we're doing because, as we mentioned, this can be eyelid, the eyebrow, lip liner, um, removing two entire eyebrows versus removing just a little bit off the tail of each eyebrow, but. Again, ballpark, usually, particularly if we're using these, you know, more sophisticated technologies, you know, usually it starts around $450 and, and upward, again, depending on the complexity of what we're doing. If there's, um, you know, multiple sites, different colors, the price can go up, but it can start as low as that. Um, and so that's sort of a, a, a good starting point. Okay. And... Um... Uh, last question that just came in. What's the main reason people remove eyebrow microblading? Uh, in my experience, it's usually overcorrection, meaning the microblading goes beyond where they wanted their eyebrow to actually cover. Um, and that's usually, you know, on, either on the medial aspect, it, it, you know, too far out this way, or, you know, the hair ends here and then the microblading goes up above the natural hairline. So from, in my experience, it's typically an overcorrection. Mm. Um, sometimes it's a it's a color issue as well, but I think just in terms of going off the numbers, I would say the most common one is just either it's too thick, the wrong color, or it's overcorrected. You know, I don't you don't really see, you know, with with microblading, pigment migration is really seen more with traditional tattooing. Um, so again, you know, these things of you know overcorrection, wrong color. Some of this can be you know avoided by doing your research, um, really making sure when it's done to clearly express your, you know, desire of what type of eyebrow you want. But that said, things can help happen even in the best circumstances. But I would say overcorrection and sort of too dark of a color are, the, are probably the two most common uh, reasons I see. Great. All right. Well, this was extremely educational. Um, thank you all so much for staying on. Again, this was recorded. So feel free to forward this to any friends. If it's not awkward. So you're not telling them you don't like their microblading, but just as an option of anyone that you think might be interested. Um, we are available. We have amazing board certified dermatologists and plastic surgeons in our Manhattan office. And we also have our board certified dermatologists at our Southampton office. So we would love to see anyone that tuned into this webinar um, anytime, please, you know, contact us, call us, email us. We would love to chat with you and see if we might be able to help with your permanent makeup. Because as Dr. White showed us, there are a lot of options and it's not just remove or keep. There's also fading and reshaping and sounds um, it, it sounds like a lot of great options for you if you're not really satisfied with your look. So thank you so much again, Dr. Weiss, for sharing and downloading all this knowledge to us and giving us your time today. Thank yeah, you. Everyone pleasure. Thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining us, everyone. And hopefully that was helpful. And um, 
we're here if you need us. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. All right. Take care. Good night. Bye.